episode one of Trev's Review Show here on Trev TV. Yeah, another new segment. I know. But this is the one I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Going all the way back to the second incantation of Trev TV. But anyway, I'm the Trev. Y'all know that. If you're tuning in, if you're watching, that's too sweet. Anyways, for a first episode, I'm not really reviewing anything. I know, I know. It kind of defeats the purpose of calling it a review show, right? But what I am talking about, I'm essentially ranking. I will review them all as time permits because it is a big franchise, it is a big series. It's the James Bond series. And I'm ranking them in order of my personals, favorites to least favorites, going from 24 to 1. Yes, there are 24 movies in the James Bond franchise, if you didn't know that already. But, having said all that, let's begin my countdown. So this is all of them. All 24. I haven't, had been, haven't been able to do a marathon since the world is not enough. And even then, that was a two-day two day thing. Days, I mean two days straight, as in 48 hours, as in no sleep. Just watching them continuously. Can't really do that kind of a marathon anymore. So, it's a lot of memory, a lot of taking notes, and I've probably seen every movie in the franchise at least 50 times each, counting Spectre and Skyfall. But, this being my countdown. So number 24, the one I will not recommend anybody start first with. The Man with the Golden Gun. It just felt uninspired. The story was evident. I got where they were going. But aside from Christopher Lee as Scaramanga, I can't really think of too many good things. I mean, it could have been a lot better. And if they would have kept that slide whistle out of the car stunt, that would have made it ten times better. But I'm not saying that's what ruined it. I don't know. The motivation to me wasn't there. I wanted to like it. I really did. But I just... I can't. Number 23 on the list. A View to a Kill. It's not that it's a bad movie. It's... With Roger Moore being 58 at the time this was filmed, it was a little hard, and he wasn't aging well. I mean, he, he was getting old, physically. It was really hard to take him as seriously as a chick magnet super spy agent that, you know, all I had to do was blank and he got the chick. You know, maybe, maybe I'm just being a little too, I don't know, what's the word? Expectationally? But this one should have been made with a different Bond, I think. I mean, Roger should have just stopped. But it is what it is, and that's why it's this low on my list. Next up, and it's a shame, because this was supposed to be an anniversary film. Die Another Day. I got where they were going, throwing every little slice of memory berry you can into this one. That wasn't even the problem. Halle Berry wasn't even the problem. Brosnan getting old? Yeah, a little bit, but he was still believable. No, my problem? Too much CGI. It might have worked in films like The Matrix, but it doesn't necessarily work in this particular James Bond movie. Which is a shame. It could have been something really, really good, but you got what you got. Octopussy. Again, this is another one where, with Roger Moore showing his age, it was a good Cold War story. But it could have been so much more. I mean, I, I hate to think of it as something like The Man with the Golden Gun, where it just felt uninspired, but it's, I couldn't click with it at all. But it's a good story, just could have been done a little bit different. I'm really hating on the Roger Moore ones, aren't I? 
Moonraker. This was made in 1979. That's, that's, that's for the record. The special effects, yeah, I get it, the whole story, even in the novel, was based in space. But, I mean, it's a blatant com competition to Star Wars. I mean, I can't say I blame it. Star Wars was a runaway hit. <clears throat> Again, good story, good locale setting. No, well, Everything's good when you have a Dr. Goodhead in the movie, right? I don't know. I mean, it's not that it's bad. It's very hard to connect to, again. And that's a shame. Sticking to picking on Roger Moore. Live and let die. And this is, this is one of those instances where the song outclips the movie. It felt campy. Not like 1966 Batman campy, but it felt James Bond campy. And that's a shame, being it was Roger Moore's first Bond film. I mean, you would have hoped it would have been so much more better. But, again, it just felt too campy. I get the black exploitation thing. I mean, that was a hit at the time, so of course it's, it's incorporated. But if they would have left the shark scene that ended up going into License to Kill from the novel, maybe it would have been better. But this was 1973, so can't expect much. Stop picking on Roger for a bit. Tomorrow never dies. It's not a bad movie. It's just it's there's so many better movies that I put before it. I mean, a, a news mogul is a villain. who's all about being you know part of a new world order. Yeah, I I dug it. I mean, the remote control car. From your phone, that was pretty sweet. Um, I'm not. I wasn't a big fan of him switching the guns, going from the P, P, PPK to the P99. Too blocky. Too blocky. You're, you're taking away iconicness at its best, but you know, I guess with it, like all things, it's got to evolve with the times. Not a fan of the theme song though. Next up. Quantum of Solace. A lot of people hate on this film, and I think that's just because they can't get past the theme song, which is probably by far the worst theme song of the entire franchise. But overall, it's not bad. I mean, it has its moments where it kind of looks bad, but after you get past the opening sequence with that amazing stunt scene, nothing compared to Casino Royale, but I digress. It's not a bad plot. Would I have cast a different villain? Oh yeah, in a heartbeat. One that looks a little more menacing than one that could possibly feel like a villain instead of just an eco-terrorist. Remember me talking about a couple of films already feeling uninspired? It's probably the worst. And it's Connery. Again, good story, good plot. A lot of people... Connery included, just didn't feel like they were too into it. And maybe it's because he wasn't. You know, I mean, around this time he was publicly letting it known that was his last one, so I think it was just there just to finish it up and then go from there. Little did we know. But, again, uninspired, but otherwise good. Number 15. The Living Daylights. To be that high up isn't a bad thing at all, especially when you've only done two Bond films. <clears throat> Once you get past the score, which is very mid-80s, late-80s synthesized pop, and you actually pay attention to it, it's, a, it's another Cold War story, but it's really well done, really well done. Again, it's not to say that it's a bad film, because it's not a bad film, it's just there's so many better films before it. All in all, I mean... There really wasn't too much in the way of flashy gimmick that would be, you know, come to, that a lot of people would come to know as his signature style. But with Dalton, I think it's kind of one of those he kind of 
we call the Living Daylights kind of trying on the suit and kind of getting used to it. I mean, it didn't help that the script was written with Brosnan in mind, but it was okay. Next up, we're going to the first. Again, not that it's bad. But to me, and this might only be me, Connery gives me the impression of a cop, not a spy. Granted, if, you know, the special effects and digital effects and all that were around in 1962, it might have been a little more, not over the top, but a little more flashy. But at the same time, they did the best they could in 62, and it came out to be a good film. Overall, no real complaints, other than Connery kind of feeling like a cop and not a spy. Lucky number 13. The world's not enough. This one confused me at first, because I wasn't sure if Renard was the villain, or if Electric King was the villain. A little bit confusing, but once you figure out who's who, and once you can get past Denise Richards and her god-awful acting, were there no better Bond girls you had your pick from? Denise Richards, really? It's not that hard. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. It uh, kind of went different directions in this one. I mean, here you actually saw MI6 getting attacked. When's that ever happened? Of course, it's happened a lot lately, but in the films before this, when did that ever happen? Never. Unfortunately, it was the last appearance of Richard Llewellyn, Richard the Desmond Llewellyn, who we came to know and love as Q. He died in a car crash that year. Rest in peace. But not a bad film all, all, either way. Moving on up. Diamonds are forever. Again, little did we know that he'd be back, but he was back. And for this last one, unless you count Never Say Never Again, I don't own it. I'm looking for it. Mostly just to say that I have it. Same thing with the 60, 67 Casino Royale spoof, just to say I have it. But... We'll get there when we get there. All in all, not a bad story. I mean, it sounds like something that would be pitched by Blofeld, which made it believable. Um, I couldn't get past Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid at all. They just annoyed me at the first few times I saw it. But I managed to get away, get away around that. Um, you know, having the car tilt and then have it tilt the other way, that wasn't believable, but... It was a neat effect, thankfully. No slide whistles. From Russia with Love. For a while there, this was in my top five. For a while. It was a really good, it still is a really good story. You know, just have one completely oblivious girl and one English spy being led into a very obvious trap and spring the whole thing. You know. Grant was by far the best character in this movie. Donald Grant, the uh, KGB guy that was the bodyguard for, or not even so much the bodyguard, but more or less the muscle and the, the killer for, for Spectre. He's probably my favorite character in this whole movie. Not the whole series, but I would, would put him in my top five. Top five. All in all, this would probably be one I would recommend to people to start off with first. But there are more. Made our way to the top ten. You still with me? Number ten. Spectre. A lot of people hate on this film. I don't know why. I get it, you know, rewriting the whole Bond Blofeld story is not necessarily the best way to approach it, but at the same time you gotta remember Casino Royale was the reboot. So this is just their way of introducing Blofeld, maybe. And I thought Christoph Waltz's Blofeld was amazing. I don't know why everybody hated on it. I thought it was good. Compared to, you know, I mean, he was no, no Telly Savalas, but Telly Savalas was no Donald Pleasance, and Donald Pleasance sure as hell isn't Charles Gray. All in all, I mean, I liked it, you know. It, appeased, it appealed to me on a lot of different levels, and having Monica Bellucci as a Bond girl, oh, yes sir, yes sir, three bags full. That was awesome.
license to kill. This was probably the best representation of James Bond at the time until Casino came out. Dalton really fit the role perfectly. The story was a very good vindictive revenge story and it was I loved it. I loved it. The first time I saw it, I think I watched this one many times repeatedly for days, weeks. Not not as bad as I watched The Dark Knight, but that's a different story for a different day. All in all, and you got a young Benicio del Toro in here. Some trivia for you if you if you didn't know that. All in all, this is another one I would recommend people to start off with, if not immediately, in their top top ten. on Roger again for eyes only this one's another good one and there's no gimmick necessary really except for maybe that face chart computer that they have in the, in the near beginning but you don't have the fancy gadgets and gizmos and all that stuff it's an actual bare bones kind of spy film which is good definitely one I recommend to a lot of people um you know, continuing with the Cold War theme when that they started with The Spy Who Loved Me. And you still have a lot of the major Russians involved in this story. And it doesn't go unnoticed. All in all, a good film. It should have been Roger Moore's last as Bond. But it wasn't. I can't answer why. But it should have been his last. This was my introduction to James Bond. I didn't watch it fully, all the way through. Not until I got into Bond much later. Like, this came out in 95. I saw bits and pieces of it. I didn't watch it, like I said, all the way through, from beginning to end. That came in 97, when I really got into the James Bond thing. But this is a nice comeback story. You know, the fact that it's actually filmed in Russia made it awesome. The tank? Who doesn't remember the tank? Oh... And the whole, you know, hacking thing from a ex double O agent. You know, this is when hacking and internet and all that stuff was the next biggest thing to slice bread. So naturally, it made its way into the story. And having Sean Bean as 006 was a cast of brilliance. Probably one of the best villains in the whole entire series. But a good watch. Okay, this is the last time I'm picking on Roger. <clears throat> I know I've been picking on him a lot, but this is the last time I'm picking on Roger. Spy loved me. This was when, I think, Roger Moore made, made it believable that he was a James Bond. And it wasn't the campy bits anymore. I mean, there was still, you know, tongue-in-cheek comedy here and there. But when he had to be assertive, he was assertive. When he had to be physical, he was physical. Jaws doesn't hurt this film either at all and I mean I mean it wasn't to the point where it was like Thunderball where a lot of it was done underwater but the scenes that were underwater are a lot more clear than Thunderball was but still a good watch what well obviously it's number six on this list so one of my favorites we're in the top five you still there that's good Number five, Goldfinger. A lot of people have this in their top three. I'm not one of them. But it's not to say that this is bad, because it's nowhere near bad. This was a really big step forward in fa as far as the franchise was concerned. Not just storyline-wise, not just box office-wise. It set the tone for every James Bond film that's come along since. And for good reason. I mean, come on. Raiden Fort Knox? Who hasn't dreamt of doing that? Coming up with the plan to do it? That's awesome. Of course, it wouldn't work in today's society, obviously. I mean, now everybody's seen Goldfinger. I'm sure Fort Knox has a contingency plan in place for something like that. That shouldn't stop a guy from trying. That's not me encouraging you to do it. But definitely something I recommend to everybody if they've never seen it. When you've only done one Bond film, 
it's easy to know which one I'm talking about. Honor Majesty's Secret Service. I think I like this one the most. Not so much because it's a different character or it's a different person as James Bond, not because you know, there's a little bit of vulnerability in the role, but because this is the one that actually stuck the closest to the novel. I do have the novel, by the way. George Lazenby wasn't all that bad. I mean, you could definitely see where his inexperience came out. You could see where he was better in other areas. And Diana Rigg, oh my goodness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, if only I was in my 20s and the 60s. But anyway, another great film. You know, I mean, having Telly Savalas as Blofeld was really a neat little twist. Because I was, the first time I came out of seeing You Only Live Twice, going to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, I expected a Blofeld with a scar, and there was no scar. But I'm sure that's. I'm sure there's a reason why Blofeld changed his appearance every other film. But I don't have that explanation for you right now. All I can tell you is this is number four on my list and something I'll always recommend to anybody who's never seen a Bond film. Number three, the good old reboot, Casino Royale. I'm not going to lie. When this first came out, I was a skeptic. I didn't even see it opening weekend. I was that skeptical. Until I saw it. It changed everything. Everything. And I think that's the reboot it needed. I mean... From the onset, you don't think of Daniel Craig as a James Bond character. Or somebody who could play the role, but he does it well. He does it really well. Having the parkour in the beginning. <laughs> that chase scene. Oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. I don't know where I could begin on all the good points of Casino Royale. You know, having a consistent Felix Leiter for a change. That's awesome. The Chief, amazing villain. Mr. White, I didn't understand until Spectre came and tied that up for me. So when I rewatched Casino, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I get it. But a great film. A great film. And I mean, to be number three out of 24, that's, that's pretty awesome. The last time I'm picking on Daniel Craig <clears throat> for this video, Skyfall. It was so nice, I saw it twice the same weekend, which was opening weekend. I skipped work to go see the earliest pr pr showing of this. And it was worth it. It was well worth it. Like, And this was another anniversary film, and this is what Die Another Day could have been. Because Die Another Day was the 40th anniversary, this is the 50th anniversary. And they tied in the member berries nicely. Not comically, so that's like, oh, hey, I remember that. I mean, maybe the worst one they do is the, the DB5. With M looking at the red button, like, no, don't you dare push that red button. But, I mean, obviously, the biggest, or the most successful box office Bond film. Again, good reason. You know, without giving away spoilers, if you haven't seen it, check it. Number one on my list. I can see some of you Bond fans already starting to cringe because you know what I'm about to say. Thunderball. I'm biased, and this was the first James Bond film I watched front to back, and I was hooked. I mean, like I said before, the underwater scenes were a little bit hard to make out in the beginning. When After you watch it more than once, you kind of make it all out, and then it became a lot more clear. But, uh, yeah, no. Where do I begin? Where do I begin? Uh, having Fiona as the assassin? Uh, she can hunt me down any day of the week. Any day of the week. Oh, yes. Yes. And Claudine Auger's Domino was pretty awesome. I mean, yeah, she was overdubbed because of her heavy French accent, apparently. But she played with the role nicely. And a jetpack. Who, who wouldn't want to have a jetpack in the boot? You know? That's just, oh. The first world problems this film presents. But that's my favorite one. That's the one I'll tell everybody check out first, and then if you don't like that, check out everything after that. Make up your own mind from there. So that was episode one of Trev's Review Show. And I promise for the next review show, I'll actually review something. I don't know what, but I wanted to get this one out of the way first. Because, like I said, this has been one that's been 
bugging me to be made for a long time. Not so much because it was a review show, because it was ranking the Bond films, and I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'm a pretty big James Bond fan, so it was kind of important I did something like that. Feel free to like this video if you liked it. Hit subscribe on the way out. You can find me on Facebook at Trev's TV. You can find me on Instagram at Rockstar Trev TV. In the meantime and in between time, keep on the lookout for more videos from the Trev. Later.